Welcome to the Lions Den. Um, my name is Markus Müller, and I'm going to briefly introduce um, the other participants and somehow try to um, lead us all through this presentation, through this talk. Afterwards, uh, we would be very happy to answer any questions that might have come up. Tobias Rehberger is an artist based in Frankfurt and Berlin. And uh, as you all possibly know, uh, participated in a couple of international exhibitions. We first worked together in the 90s for sculpture projects in Münster in 97. And Tobias um, did win the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale in 2009. Uh, and we will see slides showing that work uh, later on, and he also participates in the um, exhibition that the Museum for Modern Art in Frankfurt will open this coming Sunday. It's the celebration of uh, 20 years of MMK, and Tobias is also represented in the collection uh, of the MMK and will contribute uh, at least two pieces I know of to that exhibition. Susanne Gensheimer, to my right, is the director of the Museum for Modern Art in Frankfurt and was the curator of the German Pavilion this year, representing the work of the late Christoph Schlingensief. And um, yeah, once again, as you probably have known, uh, she was uh, awarded with the Golden Lion for that pavilion presentation as well. Um, one of the topics of the talk um, uh, is trying to describe this state of emergency that a Biennale is in contrast to uh, everyday practice, the museum practice, or as uh, Tobias said when we met, uh, the museum, uh, another state of emergency. Um, Susanne and I basically just came back from Venice and she immediately got into the installation or the finishing of the installation of uh, the exhibition in Frankfurt. Um, what I want to do at the very beginning is we will show a couple of slides from Tobias's installation there. Uh, it's still um, about to be done. So very rudimentary um, state of the moment images. Let's just move into Venice Biennale, and Susanna, maybe you can say a couple of words mm -hmm. about this uh, special sit situation, about the working um, on the pavilion and how it all unfolded. Yeah, um, after the death of uh, Christoph Schlingensief in August last year, I decided to continue with my plan to present him at the German Pavilion in Venice, and um, I started to collaborate very closely with his wife, Aino Labarenz, and uh, other companions of him who have been working with him over many, many years, who are very, very familiar with his work. And so all together in a kind of teamwork, we developed um, this exhibition in the German Pavilion. And uh, our first decision was, and that's maybe the most important uh, question we had to answer at the beginning was, would we realize his ideas, which he had already developed for the pavilion, or would we not? And we said, no, we cannot, because they are not finished enough, they are not developed enough, so nobody from us is able to play Christoph Schlingensief. And uh, uh, out of this reason, we decided to show only work from him in the pavilion. The pavilion is not so large, and it is not, not possible uh, in the size of the pavilion, but also in the, in the time uh, period you have to prepare the German Pavilion to really curate a large retrospective show. So what we did was to focus only on several aspects of his work which, which we uh, found like really important. One of the aspects of course is theater and in the main hall, like this is the model and we were working first with, the mod with a model of the pavilion and in the main hall we installed a stage installation he had done in 2008 for the Ruhr Triennale. Um, it's a play called um, uh, Die, Ki uh, Die Kirche der Angst vor dem Fremden in mir, Church of Fear versus the Alien Within. 
He called that play Fluxus Oratorio. And uh, it is one of his most personal uh, plays where he um, deals with his uh, illness and um, his uh, belief and his doubt, especially his doubt, not only belief, but of course doubt, and his relation to Richard Wagner, to the Parsifal, but also to uh, visual arts, Fluxus, Joseph Beuys, Viennese actionism, and so on. And um, what you see here is a church, and this church is his church in his hometown in Oberhausen in uh, Germany, where he was working as ministrant for many, many years, and also after his death, um, uh, the burial took place, and uh, so it's uh, for him a very personal place. And um, yeah, we decided out of several reasons that we would reinstall that stage, stage in the German pavilion. And uh, although we, we knew that this will be a very emotional, very personal, um, like uh, Gesamtkunstwerk. Uh, we thought that as we all are still so much af affected by his death, which is not even one year ago, we also didn't want to work, uh, work um, like we didn't, we did not want to avoid the topic of, of his illness and his death. So that's why we very consciously said, okay, this particularly this installation we want to show here in Venice. Then very importantly is that next to that, to the uh, one of those uh, side uh, wings of the German pavilion, we installed a cinema where we showed his films, a, a series of his films. Altogether, Christoph Schlingensief did nearly 50 feature films, cinema films, and we made a selection of six, which we show in a program there. And um, this selection contains the so-called Deutschland trilogy with um, Deutsches Kettensägen Massaker, 100 Jahre Adolf Hitler and T Terror 2000, but also a very early film here. You see um, Udo Kier and um, uh, Tilda Swinton in uh, um, Egomania, and then his four last film. This is K Deutsches Kettensägen Massaker. And I found it really important to break this very kind of sincere atmosphere, atmosphere in the inner, in the, in, the, in the large hall of the pavilion, by also showing another side of Christoph's work, which is really hardcore and, um, and very different. And then in the last wing, we decided to document his, um, his last project, which was the most important for him at the end which is uh, his idea of uh, building a so-called opera village in Africa, in Burkina Faso. And they had already started uh, with, um, like, um, with the first uh, uh, buildings. And for example, the school, what you see here, is already being built at the moment. And in October, it will be finished and it will start to run. And his wife, Christoph's wife, Aino Laberenz, will from now on manage um, the, the finishing of the opera uh, uh, village as far as it will be possible, hopefully. Yeah, that's what we did. Thanks, Susanne. Um, Tobias's contribution in 2009 uh, was part of the main exhibition. And um, I believe in a tradition of works that maybe again started with Münster, where he reactivated a spot connected to the university that he opened up for all kinds of events. And uh, he basically turned one of the large lecture halls of the university into a lamp uh, to um, enlighten that scenery. And I somehow think that, that a lot of this work is what I would think in the, in the history of the tableau vivant. They are very complicated constructions where all of us can somehow enact um, uh, living pictures. And as you will see um, in photography, this uh, total installation is even more to the point. Uh, it's really quite immersive. Maybe you can what? add a couple of comments. Um, yeah. Uh, about this particular installation, what I can say is that um, it comes from uh, a kind of camouflage strategy that's called dazzle painting. It was invented in the First World War by the English to camouflage their ships. It's kind of a 
kind of a, a, a strategy to confuse space in itself, so to say. And, uh, and I had this, uh, was carrying around this idea for years, basically. Um, I wanted to do something with it. And, uh, but I didn't want to, to make a kind of installation where you would go to and have a look at it. Because, uh, you know, camouflage is, a, of course, is a, a strategy to, you're not supposed to look at it, basically. I mean, you can look at it, but it's kind of a, a kind of a, a funny paradox, especially this technique of camouflaging, because it's so obvious, on the other hand. And, and I didn't want to make a kind of a museum installation or gallery installation where you go to have a look at the work. So I was kind of waiting for an opportunity to implement it in a kind of functional space. So you would go there not to look at art, you would go there to I don't know, it could be a gas station, could be an office, could be a supermarket, but somewhere where you would go and not, and not for the reason of lo for, uh, looking at art. And, uh, and when Daniel Birnbaum asked me, who was the director then of the, uh, the Biennale in 2009, asked me if I would be interested to do something with uh, a kind of restaurant, bar, coffee bar, situation, uh, I could immediately say yes, because I had the concept already in the drawer, so to say. And, uh, and I had to take it out and, of course, uh, uh, adapt it to the, to the actual space. <coughs> the two spaces I, I was supposed to use were uh, um, five spaces the, uh, before, so we had to architecturally change a lot of things and, and, um, and finally yeah, adapt the, my uh, conceptual uh, concept, uh, uh, my program, so to say, uh, to this space. So one detail um, we're going to see in a second. Um, what do the porcini have to do with the camouflage? Um, I, I always like to, that's not only in this work, uh, a lot of my work, uh, I like to, you know, even if I follow one concept quite straightforward, I always try to put something in which kind of breaks it or kind of, uh, it's, it's like a little doubt or a little anti-concept of the, you know, something I, I don't exactly know what it means or what it, but it, 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 it kind of shows a possibility out of, of kind of, uh, uh, out of the concept. There's also, I made these posters and some of the images there were these posters it's kind of the same idea that, uh, you know, it's not just this kind of one, one way street. So there is a little ways out of the, the perfection of the, the idea somehow. Um, what's I mean, when you were saying uh, we, we, we're going to talk about uh, the emergency of the Biennale, um, it's the, the biggest project I ever did at the at Biennale. I've been at the Venice Biennale, I think, five times or something. Uh, and even if it's the biggest project, that went relatively smooth because it was a Biennale project. It was kind of, I mean, partly funded uh, uh, by the Biennale also, which is especially for the Venice Biennale. I mean, most people don't know that. You know, if artists are invited to the Venice Biennale, they don't get flight, they don't get a hotel, they don't have production costs. I mean, all that has to be found by the director of the Biennale. So uh, in this case, it was relatively smooth. But the uh, Venice Biennale in particular is a case of emergency always. I mean, I, I had things. Uh, I was once making a project with uh, Ricker Teravanija and Olafur Eliasson together. And when we arrived there, nothing was, I mean, we, we also planned a kind of a, a big pavilion, and an, an, the, the only thing that was there in the end was a division that we pl were planning of an orange plexiglass wall, which was supposed to be like six by three meters or something. And when we came, there was this sheet of plexiglass hanging from the ceiling on two uh, uh, plastic chains, and it was like a, maybe a meter fifty by a meter. And uh, I mean, that was the worst uh, scenario I had there. We, we had. You know, they had a big sign there saying Olaf Eliasson, Tobias Rehberger, Rigrid Teravanija. It took us a day that they finally agreed. We, we found other money that they would be able to do the project again. Um, 
so we agreed they're going to do the project, but we also said the first thing you have to do is while the project is not there, you have to take this sign away that this is our project. Um, in the end, nothing happened. No, the money was not used, the project was not redone, and the sign was there until the end of the Biennale. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how far it can go sometimes in Venice. I had to bribe electricians, I had to... It's quite, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's probably dif different if you're doing a, 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 a country pavilion. No, 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 no? it's not different. Okay, no, then. No. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I want to say here is that it is not different. <laughs> but I don't go into this now because Details. that would, uh, I could talk two hours or three uh, or five uh, about that. Uh. But it's really, uh, it's exactly as to be assessed. There is nothing, and you have to organize everything from water over electricity, uh, of course, the whole uh, funding. And as it's not an easy situation. Now, in both cases, I, I assume, <coughs> in both uh, the case of Christoph Schlingsi for the German Pavilion and in, in case of your work in, nine, in 2009, I suppose these projects will more or less disappear after the Biennale closes down, or does this? No, mine is still there, and it was always planned. Uh, the, the original plan, I think, the Biennale had for the whole pavilion. It was, it's the former Italian pavilion now called um, in, uh, Pavilione Cent Inter Centrale. No, uh, for international exhibitions. Yeah. And their idea was, and maybe still is, uh, that it's going to be hosting shows all year round, and not only for the Biennale time. And I think that's, that's why they had the idea to make something permanent there. Um, it's for sure, it's not going to be forever, but um, I mean, it's still there. It was there for the architecture biennale. It was open for this biennale, and maybe for the next one, and over the next one. I don't know how long, but it was planned as a permanent project. OK, so in our world, of course, the museum promises us uh, eternity. <laughs> and uh, from the from the reality of the Biennale to the MMK. As I said, um, MMK celebrates its 20 years anniversary, founded in 99. Um, it will showcase uh, for, the, for the first time in its history almost all of its collection this summer. And that is uh, possible due to um, a new space that will be opened. Uh, so it's an um, exhibition that takes place in more than one, uh, one uh, venue. You will know the MMK. And uh, I'm just going to click through um, the MMK installation shorts. And maybe you want to say something about mm. the anniversary exhibition. Mm. Yeah. The MMK, the Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt, opened its doors for the public in 91. Not 19, it's 20 years old now. and. Um, it's a ra rather small space. It, it has 4,000 square meters, and it is much uh, uh, too small for the meanwhile really very large and, uh, and very good and interesting collection of the museum. As you might know, we have like three, three directors have been or are working there. It was Jean-Christophe Ammann, who started the whole museum, who started to build up the collection. Then Udo Kittelmann came after and uh, made extremely important acquisitions. And then since uh, two and a half years, I'm there. And we are continuing to collect, to collect, to collect, mostly in close collaboration with the artists, for example, with Tobias Rehberger, who has developed not only one installation for the museum, luckily, very beautiful one. And um, now the problem is that we have this really extraordinary collection and no space uh, to show it. And what I'm doing is that I'm always changing the presentations from our collection, but still I can only show like 10% of what we have, maybe. And so, like, if you, you see Blinky Palermo, you see Mario Merz, you see Cy Trombley, Lichtenstein, Warhol, like, they're really uh, much more than what we show here, very precious and really important works, also works which have made art history where you can really demonstrate the development, the historical development of the is history of contemporary art. Here you see Douglas Gordon. And, um, and I just wanted to use MM Paris. Um, I just wanted to use, this is Michael Beutler, for example, made a huge installation for our main hall. 
uh, Wolfgang Tillmanns, who has just um, done a space, a whole space installation for the MMK, and Isa Gensken. So I wanted to use this occasion of the 20 years anniversary to show as much as possible, and I was looking for a space in Frankfurt where I could do this, and that was not easy, but at the end I found an office building which will be torn down in November this year, so for four months, we, uh, altogether six months, we could use it, and we like took everything out, the floor, the ceiling, the walls, and made a uh, presentation from the MMK collection within this building. And that's, I think, a very special, uh, extraordinary situation. It's very unusual, maybe um, sometimes a bit awkward, but sometimes uh, really excellent situations happen, like this um, presentation of Charlotte Posenensky, for example. And one of the projects we did is together with uh, Tobias, this is uh, Stefan Balkenhol. Uh, this is, for example, a wall, paint, wall uh, uh, painting of, um, of Tobias, which is in our collection. But another work we have from Tobias in our collection is the former cafeteria of the Dresdner Bank, which, as you know, um, was taken over by the Commerzbank, and by that also the collection was taken over, and the Commerzbank uh, distributed the collection to several museums, and I was the lucky one who could choose first. And I choose, I chose uh, your uh, uh, cafeteria, or cafe, or, uh, or cantina, or what it was. Now we are installing this here in the in this new building, and um, we have to open. Uh, tomorrow is the press. Yesterday it was looking not so finished, but uh, I'm sure I'm very uh, confident that tomorrow everything will be finished, so in a, in a minute we can show that to you. And this is, I think, uh, this is, uh, shows very clearly the way how the MMK has always been working, um, considering contemporary art not just as something you present. So not, a, not a lot <laughs> you can see. <laughs> that, that, that will be the... The yeah, place. It's, it's no, maybe you can go on. So that's oh, a Weber garden. This is now you can see a bit more. Yeah, very much. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is even better. Okay. So this is really a sneak preview. Nobody else has ever seen this. <laughs> Not even me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I just wanted to to finish this this one uh, aspect that we that we always cooperate very closely with the artists, with which we have mostly very long year relationships like uh, Tobias and I, we know each other f since 1999 or something where you did a project in Münster at the Kunstverein and we did already several um, uh, things at the MMK and now uh, it was totally self-evident for me that I would ask you how would you deal now with this situation that we have that space and that we have this cafeteria and what I mean, you do? Uh, it's a bit special in this case because uh, it's a bit wrong to say, uh, and uh, also since we were talking about another cafeteria, uh, cafeteria before, it looks like I'm only making cafeterias. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> um, this is actually not a cafeteria at all because it's pieces that have been standing in a, in a, uh, a corporate restaurant. Ah. And, uh, and what we are doing now for this installation is kind of since they were, st I mean, they are tables and chairs and, and lamps, and, but, but it was only islands in this restaurant mm -hmm. there uh, from the Dresdner Bank. And uh, what we're doing there in the MMK is kind of recreating a situation or kind of in, uh, inventing a display that makes sense for the pieces mm -hmm. to be shown. Mm -hmm. Because they obviously need, uh, uh, um, they need this context of the cafeteria or the, 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 the restaurant, so to say, but they themselves are not yeah. the restaurant. So we had to kind of build a restaurant around it. And uh, of course, it's a bit uh, unfortunate <laughs> that I have to <laughs> talk about something that you cannot see there yet. Um, what we finally decided was uh, that we built a restaurant um, kind of in one color. Everything is going to be orange. And then we're going to have these islands that look totally different than the context sitting in the restaurant. So the restaurant, kind of, most of what you see in this installation will be display and not the artwork. I mean, there will be some artwork sitting in a huge mm. display. And that's what we, um, I mean, as, mm. at least that's how I understood it. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think the, the important aspect is that we could also have just shown the artwork. Um, remember when we were talking first about this, uh, I also asked you, should we just show it without using it? And then you said, no, it would be, it would be better if we would then also use it and maybe make a new situation where we can where we really in fact have a restaurant and use those objects because they were that, sitting yeah. they were yeah. sitting in originally they were they were sitting in a restaurant and they had been used just as the rest of the restaurant had been used yeah. so of course you could uh, um, just put them on a on a pedestal and you have a look at them yeah. but that would only be uh, a, a part of the experience you could have with the work so yeah. For me, it was important that you made it possible that we could kind of recreate a situation where they um, would kind of almost have their original complexity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it is also very nice because uh, in this way, we now have a restaurant in that other building. And uh, the restaurant already now is so popular, popular that it is booked, nearly booked out uh, during the, the whole, whole period of the exhibition. <laughs> now, Good. now, given the fact that the, the Biennale is an uphill battle against budget problems, organizational problems, and so on and so on, um, and we've just seen that obviously the two of you made very active decisions on how to display what's in the collection of the MMK. I mean, obviously there were at least minimum two choices. You just display the objects or <coughs> you recreate a context that these objects were originally um, proposed to be in. Now, Tobias, how do you, I mean, is there um, a conceptual piece of paper, for example, that suggests these kinds of different readings to an owner, a museum? No. I mean, not in my work. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not interested in the, f the idea that uh, somebody who's confronted or in the artwork um, kind of recreates my ideas about the work. I'm, I'm not very interested in that. I have to say I'm, I kind of make them to make things clearer for myself and uh, uh, um, they're also kind of tools that I use to think about certain things but um, if somebody would just say, you know, I like the orange color that it has, I, th I don't think, uh, for me, it doesn't make sense to, to kind of translate my own ideas into other people's languages. I think, I, 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 at least I like to look at it more as a kind of accident if other people are interested in what I'm partly interested uh, in. But, uh, but uh, um, I would find it completely wrong to how I like to experience other art as well that um, I would uh, just have to kind of recreate the artist's ideas in my own head. Uh, and so conceptual papers for me are kind of more or less ridiculous because they're holding you off of uh, what's to experience art in a way that, uh, or, or to experience uh, to What's great about art is exactly the opposite. I think what's great about art is different readings, is different possibilities to kind of mirror yourself, to, to understand yourself, to understand your own thinking. And that's why conceptual papers, in my perception, uh, are kind of hopeless. OK. <laughs> so Susanna, that somehow drives me to ask you, um, What's the big deal to cooperate with the artists directly when you are installing, reinstalling um, pieces from the collection? Mm. What's, the, what's the added value for you? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, I mean, um, first, it's, uh, as I said before, art is, has not only the one aspect that you look at it and that you pre present it and that you can perceive it, but it has some thoughts behind, some, some concepts behind, some ideas uh, behind, which are much more complex than only showing and presenting. And uh, those ideas, for example, how to deal with space, how to deal with an audience, 
um, how um, uh, to deal with a collection, for example, or a city, a broader context of a place, um, be it a museum or be it the pavilion or whatever, um, that's what is interesting about the artwork. And this is, of course, in, in, in the mind, in the, in the head of the artist. Mm. And that's why I uh, prefer to cooperate with an artist in that way that he, or that we together, but, but I really leave the creative part to the, to the artist, um, is, uh, that, like I see my function in, in, in creating a platform uh, where the artist can then ho hopefully ideally or as ideally as pos as ideal as possible his uh, broader thoughts his com complex and broader thoughts I, I, I really I, I don't like so much to just buy a painting and hang it on the wall this is um, of course with if uh, like in, in, in art which is older like Blinky Palermo or, or Stephen Parin, an artist who's not living anymore, then it's interesting to think about how could we present it that its real complexity can be perceived by, 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 by the viewer. But as long as the artist is living, it is really much more, in my sense, um, better for, for the art if it's really done as, uh, as, as close as possible with the idea of the original idea of the artist, as, as in that example. All right, um, the anniversary exhibition will be up for three months. Do you know how many pieces will be on display? Uh, 1,000, 1,000. There you go, that's uh, half of the collection. Uh, even though you doubled the space that's available for you. Um, this is it from me up here. Um, time's up, any questions from the audience? Good. Well, thanks <laughs> for Thank being here. Thank you very here. much. <laughs> Have a nice day. Thank you.